Okay, perfect. Yay, everyone! We have Lola in the house. <laughs> welcome, welcome, Lola. I'm so thrilled to to have you on the podcast today. And like I told you before we started recording, a lot of people see you as a huge inspiration. So I'm so happy that we get to talk to you today. <laughs> well, thank you so much. The honor is mine. I am so excited to be here. And thank you all. Thank you. So. If you could, uh, before we start digging into your amazing career and all the projects that you've done and your journey, um, can you tell us a little bit about a favorite image of yours that you've ever taken or a favorite story uh, that you worked on that uh, is one of your favorites? Mm. Well, I have so many kind of memorable stories and photos, but the one that immediately jumps to mind is one where I went uh, oski sledding in uh, northern Sweden and I captured a moment where one of the oskis turned back and looked at me mm. and it was just this kind of eye contact. And the reason why that photo is special, you know, you're going to see it, just that kind of human to animal connection. Mm. But that was the photo that also helped kind of launch my relationship with National Geographic, right? Because ah. that photo became a double page spread. Oof. You know, and so when you open it, you see that dog looking back at you. And then that photo spread uh, photo spread was what a producer saw that then reached out to me to be part of a National Geographic channel collaboration with South African tourism. And Amazing. then that led to me getting signed by the then National Geographic uh, image collection. And then Amazing. kind of the rest is a little bit of history, right? Yes. But that image is one that really I always remember because it was it really kind of opened up a lot, you know, oh. in terms of not just taking a photo of an animal, but actually how do you connect, capturing that connection, right? Yes. Oh, I love that. that. Image, so. I love that. I love that story. And actually, I, you know, because I, I started asking this question on the podcast recently, and more often than not, what I'm seeing, what people are telling me back is, it's often images of actually wildlife and animals mm -hmm. and, and special moments like that. I think even now I'm, I'm saying and I have goosebumps. I don't know why. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. It's, and it's interesting because, you know, I love environmental portraits of people. That's kind of what I really specialize in, in meeting strangers around the world and capturing kind of just natural, raw images of them. Mm -hmm. And so for this one picture about animal, you know, like an animal to kind of be the one that jumps to mind yeah. also shows how special it also was for me as well yeah so, definitely yeah. And, and and you know i love that you shared the story how that one image opened so many opportunities for you and a lot of times it's like that in our journeys isn't it yes. that the, that one step we take that one thing we do suddenly because actually I, can, I have a similar story with my Jordan uh, yes. adventure you know I've been I've been going to Jordan I I love the community there I became you know I guess a trust like a friend of the community and that trip to Jordan really launched my relationship with National Geographic as yes. well yes. so I can totally relate to that and no, we just absolutely. never know exactly absolutely and, and the one caveat I wanted to add was you were prepared, right? Mm -hmm. So that when they came, it wasn't just like this one shot overnight success or anything. Yes. It was that you had put in the work over the years so that when the opportunity came, you were ready. Oh, so I, I just that. wanted to add that kind of caveat in there because people always think things happen overnight when they technically don't because you've been putting in years of hard work, sleepless nights, hustling, <laughs> you know, toiling until then when you are ready, and the opportunity came, then it became a perfect match. Oh, okay, Lola, we can just cut it right here because oh. this is it. This is it right there. You know, this is. <laughs> no, I'm joking, of course, but you know, this is what, at least what I, the message that I try to put out into the world for people who want to be in this path is, it takes time and it takes commitment and perseverance and being ready at the right moment it's going to come that moment for all of us in whatever shape or form. But absolutely, it's not that one day I decided to become a travel photographer. The next day, National Geographic, like, exactly. not to my door, right? <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. Oh, amazing. And we're going to get into your journey and your path because it's uh, absolutely inspiring. 
Um, you know, you've worked with some incredible brands like uh, National Geographic, like BBC, Lonely Planet, The New York Times. You're a multi-award winning journalist. Uh, you work with different brands like Intrepid Travel, uh, Mercedes-Benz and others. I, I read somewhere that um, when, uh, with your work, you want the viewers to first and foremost see the humanity in the people that you uh, that you photograph and, and you represent, and that's just such a clear vision of what you want your work to be. So I'm curious, like now that you're at this level and you have all these different uh, projects that you're working on and different uh, opportunities, what guides you, or like how do you decide what is the next thing that I'm going to be working on? Like walk us through that uh, that process a little bit. No, absolutely. I mean, if you look at kind of the work I do, I do a lot of things in different kind of arenas. And they are, the, the common thread is cultural connection, mm. right? It's connecting with people, trying to facilitate understanding, trying to create some bridge, you know, between our similarities so we can understand each other, see each other better, listen to each other. Mm. And so in my photography, that is just me you know, when I take a photo of like a stranger, letting the stranger tell me without words mm. how they want to be shown to the world, mm. right? Yeah. Because the minute I ask someone, can I take your photo? It no longer becomes about me, the photographer, what I want, but what they are willing to give me, you know, of mm. themselves and yeah. of their time. Yeah. And so for me, a lot of this kind of came from my own background, especially when I moved to the US and I was isolated a lot because people tend to isolate and exclude what they don't understand. And yes. so people didn't understand me a lot. And so a lot of that I bring now into my work. Mm. How can I create understanding? How can I create this connection so that people are not excluded? They're not isolated. They're seen for who they are because oh. that was what I wanted. And so that's what I bring into my work. I bring it into the photography, look into the person's eyes. The photo doesn't have to be the most amazingly staged, you know, photo but what you want to see is that connection that moment of intimacy when i take the picture of the person mm -hmm. then you can see that we're not looking at anything else but each other there's that moment and you as a photographer you also know this there's yeah. that moment when the yeah. person is looking at you and nothing else matters because you're both looking at each other that's what i want the viewers to see because then you have fully seen the person without then judging them based on the environment you're looking at them first right? And then in my travel writing, that's also what I bring. I write very transparently, you know, so people kind of tell me, tell me who they are through my words. And even with the book projects I do, again, it's about facilitating cultural understanding mm -hmm. so that we understand each other more and give each other space to mm -hmm. just be and exist. Ah, oh, that's so beautiful. That's just, I'm, I, I'm resonating all, all, with it on so many different levels because i think for a lot of us who get into particularly travel storytelling space i believe that's what drives a lot of us that we all see beyond um constructed notions of what separates us and we yes. see the shared humanity of us and yes. we want to share that with the world Yes. I don't know why I keep getting goosebumps today. It's you, Lola, I think. <laughs> we're talking truth, you know, we're just, you know, we're talking just real, organic, transparent truth, you know. I mean, we're all human. We all want to be seen for who we are. We want to exist without explanation. And so that's why it's kind of resonating is because we just want to be. Yeah. And we want to give that to others as well through our work. You know, so I don't know. I guess I'm too much of an idealist. <laughs> <laughs> Me too, but I'd rather be that than 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 a than a yeah. skeptic. You know. Yes. Um, yes. And and I love that you also mentioned all the different projects that you do because there is a thing. Uh, there is sort of this this train of thought that says, "Oh, you have to do one thing and do it exceptionally well." I'm a multi-passionate person. I do lots of different projects. They all revolve around the travel sphere. Yes. But, you know, one day I can be a writer. The next day I'm an entrepreneur with my travel company, like you are with Local yes. Purse, which we're yes. going to get into. Like, I just love that, that this is a model for how to be in the space and you don't have to restrict yourself to one lane, right? Yes, absolutely. And I resonate with what you're saying. And I think 
I don't know if you found out there's a word called multi-potentialite. Mm, yes. You need to Google it because I think that's what you are as well, right? Yes. And a yes. multi-potentialite is someone that thrives on lots of different passions and they are pretty good at all of them. Mm. And what happens is people tend to get frustrated at multi-potentialites because they want us to pick a lane. Yes, they don't know how to define us, right? Exactly. Going back to that, yeah. Exactly, and society <laughs> likes to put people in boxes yes. and give you labels and say, you know what, you're a travel writer. Well, but what if I'm also a travel photographer and then I'm also this and I'm also that? Am I not allowed to do all that, you know? And yes. so, yes, that is how I thrive. I am a multi-potentialite. I am glad I kind of found that. I, I try not to put labels on myself but this mm. is a label I will gladly put on because I found the community and understood this was why I felt excluded or sidelined for many years because yeah. people felt like they couldn't define me or couldn't put me in a box or in one lane you know? yeah so absolutely, absolutely. that's yeah. amazing um so let's get into a little bit of your story so some some time ago you made a bold move of leaving behind your programmer's job in Ohio, I think it was Ohio, and applying for a, a media team volunteering position for a race in Fiji. And that was when you were like, I'm just going to go for it. This is going to be my career from now on. And I'm wondering what was that thing that really helped you overcome that fear if you actually maybe you didn't have that fear but i know a lot of people listening have that fear of leaving something very traditional very secure behind and saying you know what i'm just gonna go for this thing okay. like how so, did that so, happen for you no absolutely so, so i'll give you a little bit of more context i was still a programmer when i went to fiji and i was still a programmer when i came back I uh, just started very quoting. important very crucial exactly <laughs> exactly so i did not just swan dive <laughs> out of all my responsibilities into this, right? That makes sense. So what, I, yeah. so what I did was when I came back from Fiji, I started plotting how I wanted to transition. Mm. And Fiji was 2002. So I'm dating myself now, but that experience was 2002, <laughs> long time ago. And I didn't leave my programming job fully until 2009. So that oh, was okay. seven years later, but I already started on the side building my travel writing portfolio mm. so that by the time I was able to leave even though I did I took a nosedive in terms of the income yeah. like I lost about 60 percent of my income yes it wasn't to zero so at yes. least I took a dive and started at 40 and then built my way back up and even more over the years right mm. so and I think I wrote about this is yes life is short we have to do what we want to do now if you have some responsibilities, that shouldn't stop you from doing what you want to do, but they're also still your responsibilities. So you have to find an adult way of trying to uh, get out of them, you know, at least wrap them up so you can do what you want to do fully, right? So yes. for me, that was uh, that was my way of thinking is I knew this was my part. I wasn't just going to go and quit right away. Some people, maybe that works for them. If they have no other responsibilities, they'll have no mortgages or are just free. Absolutely. But for me, you know, I had a condo, you know, I was paying, I had my car, you know, I had a life. And then I was, I just had to create that transition period as well as create my portfolio as a travel writer and start building kind of that brand and that, you know, side of me so that mm -hmm. when I did leave, it wasn't just into like oblivion or so. Gosh, Lola, I think very uh this is a very refreshing way to talk about quit your job and pursue your dream yes. type thing because a lot of people talk about it in a lot of different ways but there's always like i feel like there's these two extremes you either quit your job immediately and swan dive like you say or you um sort of you know don't do it because you're scared right All right but i love how you put it do it the adult way <laughs> There is a third way. There is many different ways yes. to arrive to where you want to be. You know, exactly. this is this is this is just absolutely great. And mm -hmm. the thing you said about building your portfolio, right? This is so crucial. 
and that goes back to that, that we, what we just talked about where Nagio knocks on your door. You have to build your portfolio and that takes time. Yes. And so what is that way for you? If, you, you know, if you're listening right now and you, are, you, know, you, you have a job that maybe takes all of your juices, Correct. because that was the case for me. I had a corporate job that absolutely squeezed me so dry mm. that I had nothing to give to anything else outside of that. So for me, the option was I need to quit this corporate job because I'm not able to co-build co in that space. But maybe you have a job that gives you more space. So then in that space is when you create that portfolio and, and do it this right. sort of, you know, more gradual way. I guess yes. the point is that there are so many different ways to arrive yes. at a place course, where you want. Of course. And if you are actually at a corporation where you absolutely need that job or you feel like the only other option is to quit it, then what you have to do is, first of all, look at all your skills, mm. right? Am I a writer? Am I a photographer? What can I do? Can I maybe copy edit, you know, for a while and then leave that job that is that you want to leave that you hate, but then take some of those skills and try and get something part time or what I call anchor clients. Mm. Most travel writers are not travel writing full time. They actually have a lot of anchor corporate clients yes. so that they can. So, so half of their time is travel writing. The other half are for the corporate clients where they use their skills to make more money in those environments, whether it's copy editing or ghost writing or brand collaborations, that's where they make most of the money. Yes. The editorial is just the fancy bylines. Yes. Because most editorial, they don't pay that much. Yes. You know, oh my gosh. Max, it's max one to $2 a word. Most of them are much less than that. So most travel writers don't just do that. They actually have other kind of side gigs that's related to their skills. You know? Yes. So, so, so that's so. If you're in that corporate job, it doesn't mean you can't leave. You can still leave it, but you can then kind of, I call it, um, not putting your eggs in one basket. Yes. I don't do that. Yes. <laughs> I have like one egg in a million different baskets, you know? <laughs> and then putting those skills in different places so that it keeps you afloat while it carves out time to actually do what you want to do. Ah. Oh. Lola, exactly, right? Exactly it, because I think that there is this, the re, like, not a lot of people talk about this, basically, yes. that that's the reality, right? That's how we are able to go on with this lifestyle, because yes, like this industry doesn't pay investment banking salaries, no. unfortunately, no. No, no. <laughs> right? But, and, and for me, what I always say is find something that can sustain you as yes. you continue in this path as you continue pursuing those dream projects of yours what what can i be and and, and and i love that you made it really practical for our listeners like other skills that you have or you know skills that are related to this dream that you can work with corporate clients with with yeah. brands uh, there is so much uh demand for that yes on that side of the of, of the equation right that it's yeah, it's absolutely doable Absolutely, you know, and so that's, you know, so most travel writers do that, you know, or even travel photographers, especially mm -hmm. with last year, you know, and just the way travel world came to a standstill, most of them do other things as mm -hmm. well. It's still related to their skills, so it's not like really random, otherwise then you're not moving forward, mm -hmm. right? What you want to do is do things with your skill sets, things that you still enjoy, you know, that will still keep moving you closer to your to your goals. Yeah. So absolutely. Love it. Love it. Okay. Let's talk about pitching because pitching is something that always scares people a lot. And this is something that I found people put, people are not able to untangle their personal worth yes. and the pitches <laughs> that they put out. And so when those rejections come or when that silence comes, it's like this is a judgment on how horrible I am. Yes. <laughs> and I'm dedicated, yes. yes. dedicated the whole podcast to saying, no, let's untangle those because that doesn't yes. mean absolutely that you're, uh, you know, that you're not good enough. But what I want to talk to you about is specifically rejections, right? Yes. Because that is... For every one pitch that you send out, or sorry, for every 10 pitches that you send out, maybe, I don't know, nine of them will come back rejections, you know, overall. That's the nature of the industry. So how do yes. we navigate that? Exactly. 
So I don't know if you know this, but for 10 years, I publicly published on my blog all my assignment rates, my rejections, mm. my in limbo, and then pictures that's I brilliant. had nothing from. And that's I call brilliant. them my pie chats. And I'll send you a link to that because oh, I think brilliant. you'll find that interesting. So I started from 2008 to 2018. I stopped because at that point, I just felt like I didn't need to anymore. But I, for 10 years, I publicly created a pie chart that showed you know, 30% acceptance rate at the end of the year, or, you know, 10% rejections, 30% interested, so that it was kind of transparently showing what the industry was like, as well as showing how I was growing as a writer mm. using the feedback. I love Because it. a lot of writers do not know how to self-assess. They do I not know it. how to edit or audit their work, and they take things too personally, Right. So when I started my first few years, just the pie chart was mostly red, <laughs> just rejections, right? <laughs> and I was throwing all sorts of pictures out until I started looking at the responses I was getting back. When an editor writes back to you and says, not interested, that's a good thing. One, their email still works. Two, they're still <laughs> at the magazine. Three, it's an opening for you to then ask them. So, for example, if an editor says, sorry, we're not, we're not covering Jordan right now, and they reject you, you just write back, thank you so much. What are the regions you're covering or interested in? They'll tell you, Middle East. Then two weeks later, you say, oh, here's a story from Oman. <laughs> that is how you work. That is how you work as a writer to really mine. And then most of the times, the editors give you ideas and clues into why they are rejecting the pitch. So they may say, oh, sorry, we've already published something similar. Oh, sorry, we've already published something similar which means I, as a writer, I am late to pitching. So yes. when an event happens, I'm pitching too late because they've yes. already grabbed it, you know? Yes. So there's so much you can do. Rejections are great because they give you a lot to work with and they can help you get better. So over the years, I, I pitched a lot less and got a lot more acceptance, you know, obviously because, you know, you have to grow with each year. Yeah. And then I am grateful that at this point, I really don't send out a lot of pictures anymore. You know, it's, I've kind of built like a regional expertise and theme expertise so that editors now that have worked with me or are comfortable with me or are interested, reach out to me to see if I'm interested in the stories. So what you want to do as a writer is look at rejection as just a blessing in disguise. And all, and it doesn't matter how far up or how far wherever you get to in your career, rejection still happen. I mean, I, I have a, a novel that's coming out in September that was rejected 70 times, 70. I read that. I read that somewhere. Yes. <laughs> yes. So, yes. so rejection is part of it. So if you take everything personally, you have to maybe step back, go thicker skin, and then jump back into the game. So. Uh. I love it, Lola. It's such a great advice for our listeners because that's that's exactly it. And what you said there um, about when a when, when an editor sends you a note that says I'm not interested, it's an opportunity to ask questions. Yes. What I always say is don't treat this as a one-time event when you pitch and it's sort of make or break. It's it's an opportunity to start a relationship, which yes. is more important than yes. the one pitch, right? Which is exactly, exactly what you're talking about too. Exactly. That that's it. You know, just it's about relationships, you know, and it takes time to call, cultivate them and respect them and also being um kind of for lack of a better word, available as well. Mm. So so editors tend to remember writers that helped them at the last minute when they yes. were in a bind, you know? And, yes. so I, and so within reason, you know, you have to do it within reason, but if you have the bandwidth to help with the last minute, they, re, they tend to remember things like that as well, that, you know yeah. what, I was in a bind and this writer came and really helped me and yeah. created epic work, you know, whatever. So, yeah. so there are many, I mean, if you, if you look at those 10 years, I, I have a lot of detailed notes, you know. I have the pie charts. I talk about, I give advice on what to do and things like that. So, so I'll oh, share that with you. That's brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Lola. <laughs> I'm going to change spot real quick because the sun is moving here in uh, Barcelona. And now I'm in the sun. And one second, sorry. I think my computer is also 
it's an old one, so it's like <laughs> not gonna handle that very well. Low stress. Here, Low one stress. second. Um, but um, the other thing uh, that I just wanted to tease out from from what you just said is um, what I share with people uh, is put yourself in the editor's shoes and how can you make their job easier, which is what you're just talking about, yes. right? They're going to yes. remember that exactly because yeah. they have a, their job is not the easiest too. They're very overwhelmed. Uh, they have a lot of demands on them. Yes. They have tons of pitches coming into their inbox. So if you put yourself in their position, you will understand. I think you will get that empathy. Um, and yeah, if you can make their job easier, if you can, uh, help them out in a crunch, you know, they will come yes. back to you because they'll want to work with you. And one thing I did want to add as one extra tip is I know there are a lot of software that people use to track if somebody has opened your email to read it. Don't, mm. don't use it. Oh, interesting. I don't, I don't use it. I, I use it, it myself too. So I'm no, curious why. No, because it breeds unnecessary resentment. Oh, because somebody, you see that the person has read your email, but you have no context. You just see that they've responded they've read it and then you feel like why are they ignoring me but they've read mm. it but what's this but you don't know the context of why they haven't responded mm. and so it can breed unnecessary resentment yeah i used to use them but then i stopped because yeah. people are busy people have lives you, you just don't know and yeah. what you don't want is to feel like especially if you are waiting for a response yes. and then you see that the person still looks at it every day but isn't responding it can breed unnecessary resentment. Yeah. So that's why I, I took it off. I no longer use that kind of tracking to see mm -hmm. if somebody opened the email. It's out there, it's in the world. If they have time, they'll respond to it. I'll do a follow-up. But I do not want my emotional mental state to be tied to mm. waiting to somebody responding to my email. Yes, that's brilliant. That That's very important. Um, yeah. I think you, what you're talking about here is... A skill that I think is, is a great skill to have in life in general, which is about not making assumptions and not interpreting events because we all interpret events, right? Yes. We all not, and, and not making it, uh, not interpreting it in a way that again puts you down and says, well, this oh. must mean, this exactly. must mean they don't, they hate me. Yeah. Yeah. Because, and that's, because that's the thing. That's what's going to happen is, you're going to, uh, especially newer writers, they're going to think that the, the rejections they'll take personally, everything becomes a kind of heightened emotional kind of bubble, you know? And so to kind of prevent that, if you don't have to track, because I know, I mean, people that use it are usually maybe people for marketing or sales, you know, things like that. But for waiting for, for you know, editors or seeing if they've read my email, I, I had to stop it because I, mm. I saw myself becoming a version of myself mm. that I was like, why? I don't know the reason why they're not responding. You know, they're busy or I don't know. So I don't want it to breed unnecessary resentment. Yeah. So that gives you more clarity of a mental space and emotional space to just keep moving on and doing things. So. Oh, I love that. I love that. So there is uh, a story that you share in your TED Talk, uh, which mm. we're going to link to as well. And I encourage everyone who's listening to 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 watch the TED talk. It's it's really great. It's it's really, um, I mean, it's it's amazing. Um, <laughs> but what you talk, there is a story that you share that that really uh, strikes me, where you talk about the opportunity that uh, you missed to yeah. go to the North Pole that you were so close to getting, and you missed yeah. it by three votes. Yes. And then later on, you recognize, you, you, you learned that some of your friends didn't vote for you because they were like, why, why does she want to go to the North Pole? Exactly. exactly. And what I yeah. want to sort of talk about now is the fact that we are put into boxes by mm. others, but yes. also by ourselves yes. in this industry. And so how, what was your journey like to start shedding that because right. to be at the level in which you are now and and to live a life that is just feels like a very authentic expression of who you are and you're pursuing all the different projects that you have 
Are you, hello? Hi, hi, Yulia. If you can still hear me, I think uh, your connection keeps dropping out. Oh, yeah. Oh, hello? Yes, I'm still here. <laughs> hello? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay, we're, we're back, I think. Yes, no worries. I, I can hear you, but... Uh... Hello? Hello, can you hear me? I'm here. Yes. Um, I'm here too, but my Wi-Fi is just sort of. Oh, okay. I think it's back on now. Can you can you hear okay. me? Yes, I can hear you, but your picture is frozen. Can you? Can you yes, hear me? I can see you moving now. Yeah, I can hear you. I can hear you. I can see you moving. I'm gonna try something because yeah. Uh, Do you have your four G? Maybe if you did your four G as an option, I can try. I will try something be now because uh, maybe the Wi-Fi. Yes. Hi, Lola. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> can hi. you see me? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes, I can see you. The the video hear quality me? is not great. Yes, I can hear you, but the video quality is not too good. So, okay, now it's getting a little yeah, better. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. um Okay, I moved. I came I became I came closer to the to the router, okay. so hopefully that uh hopefully that works. Okay, so um, we can continue. All right. So, yeah. let's see where where was I? Yeah, <laughs> let me see where was I? Um, oh yeah, so being in boxes. So from that story, exactly. Yeah. So from that story, I guess what, what I'm curious to learn is how did it, how did that progress for you, and how did you how were you able to stop first stop letting others put you to boxes, but also how do you uh, prevent yourself? from putting yourself in that box because that's what sort of I think a lot of times that's what is stopping us from going after what we want because we are putting ourselves in that box that says well I can't do that right exactly exactly well for me it was by asking why not and that was the whole point of the TEDx talk right mm. asking the question why yes not? Yes. And when I ask the question, it can be verbal or it can just even be through my actions, right? So for the people that kept putting me in boxes or try at their preconceived notions, I ask them, why not? So if they say, oh, why are you doing this? Then I ask, why not? And then it forces them to kind of explain why they think I shouldn't do it. And then if the reason is not good enough, I, then I keep asking, but why not? Until I expose their own prejudice mm. to them. Because most people don't think they are prejudiced mm. until it's exposed to them, right? Because mm. they have preconceived notions. And then why not is also when you ask yourself, why am I not allowed in this space? Who says I'm not allowed to this, into this space? This is my, my space as well. I worked hard for it, right? So gratefully, I haven't kind of over the years, I never really let people put me in boxes or define me. You know, and that I think has been a very frustrating for a lot of people in the travel industry as well because they don't know how to define me or they want to just put a label or they expect me to do things that I don't do or I do things that they don't expect me to do. So because they have their preconceived notions of what I as a Black African woman am supposed to be doing or what I'm supposed to be writing about or what I'm supposed to be interested about, right? So... In the TEDx talk, I yeah. said, just leave your own truth. Just show up fully as yourself and live beyond other people's expectations of you because that's what actually makes you. The irony is that it makes you impossible to ignore because you're just doing your own thing on the side, outside of the expectations, you know. So just asking why not, challenging in that way but either verbally or even through your actions, just doing what really makes your heart sing, you know. Um, then nobody can, people will try to force stuff you into a box, but they can't. In the long run, they can't. Yeah. 
Lola, you know, this is so interesting because what you just said, I literally wrote it out when I was preparing for our chat. I wrote out this quote of yours. When you start living your life beyond other people's expectations of you, you become impossible to ignore. Yes. And yes. it's so powerful. Yeah, it's because so it's true. And, and the point is not to be like, oh, I want to be seen all the time. But it's just that people can't ignore the fact that you have shown up fully in your life and you're living your own life, you know, on your own terms and as authentically and as organically as possible, right? So that will be outside of the expectations. And so that will make them notice. Mm -hmm. they, they just will naturally, you know, like if there was a, something that I expected to be doing something else isn't doing it, I'm going to look, I'm going to be curious. I'm going to be wondering why. So that was the point of that. Ah, mm. oh, that's that's awesome. I, I love that. I love that. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about um, the fact that, especially when you start out in this industry, it can be such a lonely journey. And we're sort of, or at least that was my experience that, you know, I didn't know anybody in the industry. I, I had no idea what I was doing. I was just sort of poking in different directions. And I found the experience itself to be very isolating. And a lot of people feel uh, threatened because a lot of people operate from a scarcity mindset that if you take that story or if you take that assignment, it means less for me, you know? Yes. And I think yes. that's a part of the reason why I felt so lonely because maybe I was perceived as a threat to, to other people or whatever. And what I want to talk about, like I've been on the journey myself of switching from that scarcity to the, the feeling of abundance that because I'm so unique and you're so unique and everybody is so unique and have a very special way to tell stories and to look at the world. We never compete because we are all telling our own stories, you know? Yes. Yes. So what I wanted to ask you was, um, how was that experience for you? Because I think it's so important to find people and to find a community that can help you feel like you're not alone correct no absolutely you know? so first of all community is super super important you know you you need kind of fellow colleagues so that you can champion each other uplift each other and kind of share the same kind of battles you know it's the same sea different boats right as they say but what i've also found is that like you said, the scarcity mindset. Mm. So it feels like a crabs in a barrel kind of situation <laughs> where people feel like there isn't enough to go around. And for me, I come from the Yoruba tribe, right? Mm. In Nigeria, we're very community open, kind of giving, sharing mentality. And we come with a very abundance mindset. Mm. And there is a quote in my language, Yoruba, that says, the sky is big enough for all birds to fly without mm. colliding i mean that is the mindset we grew up with so me coming into a scarcity mindset a, a community feels very unnatural for me mm. right and then uh, one thing i also wanted to say is that people worry a lot about relevance staying relevant but they need to worry about evolution mm. right because what happens is as a writer you know as a photographer as a creative you evolve with st different stages of your life, you transition. Mm. When life happens, you move to a different kind of way of seeing things, of, of, of doing things, of telling stories. Mm. You're not trying to remain relevant mm. for the same audience you are 10 years ago or five mm -hmm. years ago. Brilliant. Your audience evolves with you. You lose people, new people find you. But that's what I always try to tell colleagues is don't worry so much about staying relevant because then it's going to push you to do things that you cannot sustain mm. because you're trying to stay relevant. But think about the natural evolution of your voice, of your career, of your life, and then that will be easier for you to transition into and it will bring the right people at the right time in that stage of your life. You know, so, so there are so many things I could talk about in community because community is great, but I also stay on the sidelines a lot because I am not a person, I do not like clicks, I do not do clicks. 
you know, I'm not a mm. cliquish person. I operate mm. from an abundance mindset and I feel like there's enough for everyone. There's enough to go around. I share a lot, a lot, you know. And yeah. uh, so, so that's kind of how I operate personally. Mm. Gosh, that's... It's all resonating with me, Lola. We need to meet. We need to yes, meet. Yes, we will. We will meet. We will. We will. Yes. Uh, that's beautiful. I, I couldn't agree more, of course, with, with everything that you're saying. And I think also the staying relevant part, to me, when you talked about staying relevant versus evolution, what I what it brought to mind was off the moment versus... Mm. Uh, long-term finding your own voice that you stay true to yes. uh, which is sort of a similar similar way to think about it you know when you're trying to like uh, uh chase trends yeah you're chasing trends you're not speaking from your sort of voice right which is yes. sort of similar i think to what you were talking about yeah no absolutely um, here. and i was gonna i'm gonna add um, kind of two quick things you know i'm gonna say real quick with evolution you know as you move, you become a better, richer version of yourself. That's what it is, right? When you when yes. something moves from this yeah. stage to that stage, it's getting better, powerful, whatever, you know. So you're getting to a better stage of yourself. But then I want to give you a metaphor about trends. So I look at trends like a raging mm. sea, right? A raging sea. And if you follow every trend, you are a swimmer that's jumping into the waves, trying to swim. The sea mm. can drown you. Mm because it's raging, yes. it can drown you. Yes. But if you're someone that's well aware of the trends, you're monitoring the trends, you're like a surfer on a surfboard. So mm. you're not swimming directly mm. in the, tre in the tr trends, but you are kind of navigating the trends, adjusting yourself you know, to see. You're, you still have your style as a surfer, that's your voice, but you are using the, mm. the technique, the platforms, the new trends to see how you can keep mm. moving your voice without swimming and letting the trend consume you. So that's what I always say, you know, try to be like a surfer on the waves with trends instead of just being a swimmer right in the middle of the trend, trying to out-trend the trend. It's not going to happen, you know. So that's how I feel. Yes. I'm not a big trend person. I, I keep a, abreast of all the trends. I use what needs to be used to sharpen the voice but I do not let trends consume me. Mm. Beautifully said. Yeah, very, very well said. I, I, I love that. Um, so we don't have a lot of time left, although I feel like I want to keep talking to you. <laughs> and maybe maybe two, two, three hour, uh, two or three hour podcasts will become a trend uh, in the future, right. but right now yeah. they're not, you know? <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, but... Um, I wanted to, um, oh, sorry, oh, sorry. <laughs> one second there. Uh, <laughs> I'm in this guest house and uh, there's just some, some commotion. Um, so before, um, before we wrap up, uh, I, I wanted to ask you, so a lot of people will listen to this interview and will uh, will read your bio will you know will look into you and a lot of them already know you and they will see you know all these incredible successes that you've had and and all these you know all the all the publications that you've been published at the brands the amazing books that you've done and I'm going to ask you about in every mirror <laughs> she's black because that's just uh, an incredible project too but, you know, they're going to see this picture of you, right? The snapshots of, of all the incredible accomplishments uh, that you had. Um, and, and what I want to sort of talk about now is there is a lot of um, setbacks. There is a lot of challenges. There is a lot of things that are not in the public, you know, and not a part of our public uh, picture of ourselves. Cool. Um but what I want to sort of talk about is what was for you one of the more difficult parts of this journey? Yeah. Well, I can t I'll tell you what my biggest regret was. Um, when I first moved to Sweden, you know, Sweden gives parents a year and a half or so of like maternity parental leave. When I had my first child, I took one month off. 
and I gave all that time to my husband because mm-hmm. I felt like I needed to work. I wasn't, mm-hmm. I, I couldn't sit home for a year not doing anything. That remains my biggest regret because I could have just sat home for a year mm-hmm. and done nothing. You know, so I was feeling the pressure yeah. of if I take six months, nine months maternity leave more than that, which is a luxury in itself, right? If I took all that time off, will my work still matter? Will I still be able to keep these clients with that? I, that was how I was thinking back then, you know? So that remains my biggest regret is that I did not take enough time. I was dragging my daughter around to conferences, you know, which was fine. You know, it's okay. I'm a traveling parent, but I felt like I could have taken that time at least six months, nine months, giving him the rest. So for me, that, that was my biggest regret. And so for people that want to choose a certain lifestyle, you have to create the support system to support that mm. lifestyle. Because once you make the choice, then the choice is yours. And then you have to put the systems mm. in place. To and you have to it. live it. Yeah. And you have to live it. So yeah. that, that, I would say, is my biggest. I mean, now, you know, I mean, I have two kids, you know, so, so I've learned a lot. You know, I, things are different now, you know, but I think that back then, which was nine years ago, that was what I did because remember nine years ago was about when I just left my job as a programmer and I just started working full time as a travel writer, photographer. So I felt like if I had a baby now and took a year and a half off, it was all in vain, you know? So, mm. so yes. yeah, so which comes back to social media is that some, you know, we see what we see, you know, people just share the highlights of their careers, you know? And that's fine, but you need to also know that because people are also very private. You know, I don't share my my kids or my husband publicly because I have to keep something private, you know, and I have to respect mm-hmm. their own privacy as well. So whatever decision you make, as long as your whole family is on board with it, you know, and you want to share everything, then that's fine. But oh. for me, I choose what I share <laughs> as well. Oh. Lola, dear, I, yeah. I think we had an interruption again. Oh, uh, yes, no worries. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Um, I think the last thing I heard was um, that you're keeping uh, your uh, your family private uh, yes. and you're not sharing that part of your life. Yeah, not, not on, a, you know, on like public Instagram or Twitter or things like that. I don't do that. You know, Facebook kind of with just friends, you know, like close friends, but... I, I try to keep, like, even though my work is also my life, you know, travel is our life, you know, and we've created this lifestyle that allows us to just flow between work and private life so seamlessly. Some things mm-hmm. can also still be kept private and sacred, you know, everything mm-hmm. doesn't have to be. And I think one of the things that somebody said I found fascinating was, uh, I think it was Bre- uh, Brene Brown. Mm-hmm. She said something about, Sharing publicly about your bikini wax doesn't mean you're being authentic. It's just maybe oversharing, <laughs> you know, like that's, <laughs> and, she, and it's not to say you shouldn't do it. I'm not judging. I'm just saying she had the point in that just because I share every single detail of my life, that doesn't mean I'm authentic. Mm. Yes. You know, that doesn't mean I'm more authentic than somebody that doesn't share every bit of their life yes. publicly. Yes. You know, so, so lots of things to navigate, you know, with social media. Yes, and, and you said something really important there that I hear this so often in my community that, you know, people come to me and they're like, well, I'm looking at this successful person on Instagram. I can never measure up to that. And mm. you're not getting the whole story there. You never mm. are getting the, the full story. So when we compare ourselves to somebody on social media, we're just doing ourselves such a disservice. Correct, correct. Uh, but and, also... Com- comparison, like I feel like, especially as creative people, it doesn't even make sense because creativity is subjective. Like you yes. have your own lane, you're doing your own thing. The person is doing their own thing. You see them at their, I call it, a, I don't know, I, I, I shared this recently where you see them and it feels like they're just taking the escalator up to their career with ease but you never saw when they were crawling to get to the staircase, you know?
Hello, Yulia. Hello? Hi, Lola. <laughs> okay, okay. We're gonna we're gonna wrap up. Uh, we're gonna wrap up. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Um, so, to close our conversation, um, I just wanted to ask you two questions. One. What are you uh, most excited on working on right now? And I think I know the answer to that. And then the other question. <laughs> hmm. Yes. Yes. And everyone listening, check out the book. We're going to link to the pre-order for it. Uh, it's, uh, it's an amazing story. So we're, we're very um, happy that Lola has created it. And what I want to close with is sort of this big question, but um, how would you start answering what it means to be a woman who is stepping into her brilliance today? Mm. Mm. Yeah. Mm. 
Mm. No. Oh, beautiful, beautiful closure to our conversation that was interrupted a few times thanks to the Wi-Fi in Barcelona, but <laughs> hopefully, uh, hopefully it saves and we're, we'll be able to produce the, the whole conversation. Lola, I'm going to let you go because you have a call. It was such a pleasure to chat with you and... Yes, yes. Thank you, Lola, and good luck to you with everything. Thank you so much. Bye. Oh, sorry, Lola, just one more thing. Um, don't close this window because it's going to upload the file. I'm going to stop recording now.